ownership. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Common Ground, and I'm Jason Downs. Welcome, uh, we want to welcome you to a place where we can all agree on the important stuff. It's good to have you here. Today is July 20th, and the world is still at war with the coronavirus, as well as facts about the coronavirus. I, uh, I watched a video of two young men yesterday who were filmed attempting to hand out free masks on Huntington Beach. And I, I mean, it was, it was surprising how many folks refused to wear protection, either citing their religious beliefs, their personal rights, or their political stances. Some even cursed the boys out and threatened violence just for handing out free masks. So we're gonna be talking to two different doctors today. One is an infectious disease specialist right here in Valencia, and one was the first female to be hired in the Department of Surgery, emergency medicine section at Johns Hopkins Hospital. But she also happens to be an expert on the history of silent film, specifically Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, and William S. Hart right here in Newhall. So we're gonna have some fun a little later on as well. It's gonna be a great show. Common Ground is sponsored by Denny & Company, certified public accountants. They make your life less taxing, especially now at the deadline just passed this uh, last week. There's still a lot of business to take care of, so reach out to Matt Denny for all your accounting needs at dennyllp.com or call 661-286-8860. That's Denny & Company. They make your life less taxing. Okay, so our first guest is Dr. Michael Cohen an infectious disease specialist here in Santa Clarita, California, and he is affiliated with multiple hospitals in the area, including Henry Mayo. He has been in practice for more than 20 years. He is a graduate of USC Medical School, and he did his infectious diseases training at UCLA. He is currently caring for many hospitalized patients with COVID-19 at Henry Mayo and Palmdale Regional. It is truly a gift to hear directly from an expert in our community, so please join me in welcoming Mr. Dr. Cohen. I said Mr. Dr. Cohen. Did you catch that? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Dr. Cohen. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Hello, Jason. Thank you for having me on Common Ground. Absolutely. So, you know, we're at, we're at 143,000 deaths in the United States as of now. Is there any reason for us to believe that this number is high or low or inaccurate for any reason, any nefarious political reason, any reason at all? Is this number skewed? Uh, well, you know, these numbers are created by local public health departments. Um, they, they really have no agenda except to protect the public health. And, and so, uh, Gathering data and understanding the spread or extent of these diseases is a big part of helping curb it. And so uh, th these numbers tend to be pretty accurate. The only inaccuracy is, is probably in that not everyone has been tested. So we may not know the full extent. So um, we're, we're up to about 45 million tests, right, at this, at this point in time across the United States? I believe so, yes. So you don't feel like you'll have a real, I guess, idea of the entire picture, obviously, until everyone is tested? I mean, is that, is that even possible? Uh, not only that, but, you know, we know there is a large amount of people who are relatively asymptomatic. So in, until we screen all the population for antibodies, which means you've been exposed, um, you only have a small window to get that PCR test when it'll show positive, but you make antibodies what we believe with the COVID-19 is at least for a few months, if not for a year or two. So wow. uh, some countries are trying to screen the whole population. Um, I've seen quotes like in France of about uh, six, seven percent of the population now has been exposed. So if you put that on our 300 million people in the United States, you know, we're probably talking about 10 to 15 million COVID cases. Um, so uh, there probably is a large number that isn't being found. These patients are not getting that sick. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, if anything, we're kind of underballing uh, what the actual number is. 
Okay. Well, let's take a let's take a step back for just one sec. So, how has I mean, you're an infectious disease specialist. So, how has your life changed? in the past four months. I can imagine you were busy before. But oh boy, yes. <laughs> Just give us an uh, idea. <laughs> so I, I could tell you for, for myself and the other doctors and the healthcare workers, such as the nurses, the respiratory therapists, you know, even the cleaning people who go in these rooms, um, you know, way back in March, uh, we were hit with this prospect of this unknown virus. And then on top of that, you know, seeing the large number of healthcare workers who had not only gotten the virus but had died in countries like China and Italy, uh, there was a lot of fear. Um, I had fear. I, I have a young daughter at home. I, I have a wife. I don't want them to get this. I have parents who are in their 70s. So there was a lot of fear um, and, and not much known about the transmission. Um, how that has evolved is that I think we're all comfortable now going in these rooms. We know how to gear up. We know what the proper mask is. Um, I don't believe at Henry Mayo nor Palmdale Regional have any healthcare workers contracted COVID in the hospital. But we've reached this phase where you have the same nurses and doctors going in these rooms every day, and not only going in the rooms having to put on all this equipment, which is somewhat tedious and also not comfortable, um, but also, you know, seeing the suffering and the pain. And so I, I feel a lot of my colleagues um, are just worn out. We're, we're kind of tired. We've been doing this for almost five months now. And so we what, do we, what do we do about that? I, I mean, that, that seems like a pretty, a pretty important issue as well. I mean, what are... What uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, you, you have to take time out. You have to have kind of healthy, distracting things in your life that take you away from that daily grind in the hospital and the suffering. And, and most people do have that, some do not. Um, there was a very notable case of a physician who was a very good physician, but she committed suicide just because of the overwhelming death and sadness she was seeing every day. She just couldn't handle it. Um, so. You know, basically, if you're in a large corporation or a university, there are lots of psycho, psychologic, psychiatric support. Um, you know, if you're a private physician like myself, you kind of I, I rely on my family. Um, I rely on my brand new little puppy. Uh, and just to take your mind away from things and you have to find some way to recharge the battery because... Um, you know, the, the main people who go in and out now, we're kind of the experts. And, and we know how to get in and out of these rooms, take care of the patients, and not contract COVID ourselves. And we're going to have to keep doing it. It's, it's not going away. So, Well, so, we just, I mean, uh, obviously, you've been, a, you've been a lot busier, too, obviously, right? I mean, so, so you, yeah, you were so saying. So my, 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 my type of patient, you know, I see everything from hepatitis, HIV, valley fever, any kind of infection you can think of. It's gone from 100% of everything to about 10% of everything and 90% COVID. And so in the hospital right now, I'll be seeing about 30 patients, uh, 25 of them will be COVID. How many, so, how, how many patients have you seen in the past, you know, four, four to five months who have had, who have had COVID-19? I've probably seen a total of about 150 to 160 hospitalized patients with COVID. Wow, and how? Um, and have have they all survived the virus? No. So uh, uh, most physicians, I don't believe, do this. Particularly private physicians. Hospitals are trying, um, but uh, I, I have calculated my death rate, and so. There, there's a great uh, overview of COVID that came out in the Journal of American Medical Association this week. And, and they're quoting Europe and America probably a total. Once you step in that hospital, you probably have about a 15 to 20 percent chance of dying. Just stepping in the hospital. Now, uh, most yeah. hospitals in the United States, like UCLA, their death rate, I believe, is about 12 percent. Um, my calculated death rate was 9%. I, I haven't gone through the second wave. Um, and, and it really depends on your facility and also how hard you get hit. So New York initially had an extremely high death rate, up to 25% in their hospitals because the system was overwhelmed, the beds were full. 
they couldn't get people on ventilators. Um, they couldn't get people what they needed. So one of the reasons to kind of try to spread this out and not let this virus run wild is that it does overwhelm our system, and that increases your bad outcome. That, that, that I think, is such a clear uh, picture of such a great point <laughs> um, as to why we're doing what we're doing, right? That goes to the heart of why we're doing what we're doing. That is one of the reasons, yes. And also, you know, if we let this run wild, even with a low death rate, you'll probably have one to two million deaths in the United States, which is atrocious. So if we can hold it off and keep it at bay as long as we can, not only will we not overwhelm our system, but we're giving us time to develop that vaccine or develop that therapeutic that's going to make everything better. So do you, do you think that therapy or that vaccine will prevent that one million or two million death rate? If it gets here. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, just, I just wanted to see if you, winter, you meant like either way. A, you know, I, I, were you yeah. saying? either way that we would I, I, have a million to two million? No, I, I think we will uh, intervene before that. We okay. will have a good vaccine or therapeutic. And, and I also think particularly with this second wave, quote unquote, um, some states that were very resistant to masks and you know lockdowns and things like that are now kind of opening their eyes and thinking, wow, we really got to slow this down. And um, it's sad. And one of the disappointing things for healthcare workers was it, it was slowing down. I was, you know, basically carrying anywhere from 15 to 25 patients. And then by May, I was down to two patients only in the hospital. Wow. And okay. it looked like we really had things in a good place, particularly in Los Angeles. And then it just shot through the roof again. So you saw Probably a direct. For multiple reasons. You saw a direct correlation between May and June because of the openings, because of people got, you know, like, okay, it's basically over and we're, we can live our lives again? Uh, openings, cabin fever, uh, summertime. Um, but uh, certainly in my neighborhood, in Valencia, I've seen more people interacting, getting outside. And uh, of course, um, particularly we now believe maybe up to half the spread of viruses due to asymptomatic individuals that that is going to lead to more cases. And there are people out there who are not sick. They don't look sick to you or me, but as they're talking, they are aerosolizing virus particles. So, so important, right? And so a mask is obviously the, the number one yeah. preventer. Is that, is that correct? I mean, is that- A your... mask is the best thing we have right now. Okay. Along with social distancing and being outside. If you're in a contained room with no ventilation with a lot of people, that's a much higher risk of contracting virus than outside on a windy day. That virus is going to get swept away by the air. So I'm going to. But you still don't want to be in someone's face, even outside. Sure, sure. So I'm, I'm going to keep coming back to this um, because I think it's it's so important. Um, but. You know, still to this day, like I, like the story, I saw this video yesterday about the, the boys on Huntington Beach handing out free masks, right? Um, and and the, the vitriol that they came in contact with, uh, you know, was, was surprising to me. Um, you have treated 150 patients personally. Um, is there anything about this that smacks of a hoax or some grand conspiracy? Uh, anyone who thinks that, I will take them to the COVID floor at Henry Mayo and their eyes will be open. Because, um, you know, my role that I see day to day is great suffering. It is it's the worst uh, medical disaster I have seen in my 30 years of doing medicine um, by far. And I started when, when HIV hit, mm -hmm. which was its own dilemma, but not like this. And, and um, and what about so, comparing uh, it to, sorry, go ahead, MERS, I'm saying anyone, SARS, anyone who thinks this isn't real either has had no direct contact with anyone, is nowhere near a hospital, they might be in a more regionally isolated area, but it, it's definitely real. And the cases, you look on the LA Public Health page today, there was 11 more deaths, um, about 5,000 cases in California. Uh, so it, it, it's still occurring and it's not slowing down. 
So speaking of the emotional aspects, uh, you see the, the medical, the scientific, the, the business, the social and emotional aspects every day, right? So can you give us some examples and, and what stands out to you? Well, uh, I, I could write a book on each case. Each case is a different story. Um, you know, uh, particularly I see a lot of uh, younger people who relax, they went out, they hung with friends, did whatever, they come back and either mom or grandpa or someone got COVID. And uh, I had one poor gentleman, he was 80, he got COVID, he was on the ventilator, he was dying. and. Um, the daughter, I guess, who had broke the home isolation, just had so much guilt. She wanted to give her own. One of the treatments we use is plasma, which is basically blood from people who have recovered. We think that might have antibodies or things that help patients get over COVID. Hmm. Uh, she just really could not let go. She wanted to give her plasma. She had to do something to right what she felt was this wrong. So, you know, I see tons of guilt. Um, hmm. Once they realize that it is real and now a family member is gravely ill, the guilt sets in. Um, in the hospital, we don't see much denial. <laughs> the people in the hospital get it because they're really sick. Uh, we also see uh, abandonment. So a lot of elderly come to the hospital. The family won't take them back. They're afraid they're going to bring COVID back into the house. Oh, my goodness. Um, and they refuse to take them back. Uh, it just touches on everything about us as human beings. Um, and I also see uh, uh, great love. Uh, we have uh, put numbers on the outside of the room windows and you can see the families out there waving to the window because we can't let the family members in. Um, we had a COVID survivor, um, incredibly enough, was on the ventilator. Uh, he got off, he survived. and. Uh, he has a restaurant and he brought uh, food for all the nurses after he recovered. Um, so th there's all kinds of stories, but the bottom line is it, it's real, it's still out there, it's still a health crisis. And, and, and each individual, this is something where you can figure, well, I can't do anything, I'm just one person, but actually you can, each individual can do a lot. And, and the mask is, it's not you protecting yourself. It's you showing your, your courtesy, your respect, your, your dignity as a human being, because by wearing that mask, you're protecting someone else. You're stopping yourself from spreading virus. Um, we know if someone does not have a mask and they're coughing virus on you, a lot of masks will not block that. You will still breathe it in. But if you're the one who has it and you wear that mask, it very effectively stops it from aerosolizing. So. When, when you're not wearing a mask, you're basically saying, I will not sacrifice for my fellow human being. I will not help For that. the common good, yeah. yeah. And you will not help the common good. And, and that's the bottom line. And you got to remember, you know, uh, the, the nurses and doctors, we're a little jaded now because, um, you know, I come home, I have acne around my face from wearing the mask all day. Uh, we have lines in our face now from the rubber bands. Um, so to hear people complain they won't wear a mask for like 30 minutes outside, uh, it's a little hard for us to listen to concerning what we're going through. Well, Dr. Cohen, I think you've you've spoken a lot of a lot of truths today, and I, I think you know some difficult things that we we need to hear again and again. Um, I cannot thank you enough for yeah for the good that you do, yeah. um, and. I hope that you will and come back. And just to add yes. that also I want people to know that I am also very hopeful. I, I think that we will have a vaccine soon. We will be out of this by the winter. I, I have very great concerns about school opening. But I, I think, you know, uh, us as a country, um, uh, granted, we're not in the best spot right now as far as political division and things like that, but we've always kind of risen to the occasion. and. Uh, we've gotten it together and figured things out that most countries cannot. So I, I think we will be good by next year, but uh, again, there's no crystal ball, as everyone kind of knows. Yes, but the point is you are optimistic, and that's Absolutely. exceptionally good to hear from an infectious disease expert. Dr. Michael Cohen, right here in Valencia. Thank you so much for being here, and we look forward to having you back on the show for further updates, if you're willing. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Jason. Stick around to meet Dr. Tracy Gossel uh, and find out about her love affair with the first king of Hollywood, Douglas Fairbanks. This is Common Ground on KHTS, your hometown station on 98.1 FM and AM 1220. The best live theater can be found right here in the Santa Clarita Valley. The Canyon Theater Guild has been entertaining audiences for decades with top quality musicals and plays. Located on Main Street in Old Town Newhall, CTG also offers workshops for the young actor in your family. For more information, call the box office at 799-2702 or go online to canyontheater.org. We all know sometimes people lose their way. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, The Way Out Recovery SEV may have the answers you've been waiting for. The Way Out is the premier intensive outpatient treatment center serving Santa Clarita. Asking for help is the first step. Call The Way Out today, 661-296-4444. That's 296-4444 for a private free assessment. The Way Out is an accredited, affordable outpatient program that accepts most insurance. Call us at 661-296-4444 or check us out online at thewayoutrecoveryscv.com. Quit battling with yourself. Ask The Way Out for help today. It's allergy season again. You've tried it all, yet your sinuses continue to be a problem. Try something different, something holistic, something that will really work. Acupuncture. Kathleen Keneally is Santa Clarita's acupuncture and Nate specialist. She's been treating many of your neighbors and their children for allergies, sinuses, headaches, and pain. Find out how acupuncture can improve the quality of your life. Call Kathleen Keneally for a free phone consultation. 252-4100. 252-4100. Acupuncture. It really works. Hey there, it's Story with your hometown station weather. Mostly sunny today with hot in the low to mid 90s overnight lows in the 60s for anything and everything Santa Clarita Valley related go to hometownstation.com or find us on social media at KHTS radio 98.1 FM and AM 1220 your hometown station KHTS back. This is Common Ground. I'm Jason Downs, where we can all agree on the important stuff. I had the privilege of meeting our next guest, Dr. Tracy Gossel, when she gave a lecture during the New Hollywood Silent Film Festival this past year uh, about the life of Douglas Fairbanks. It was incredible, <laughs> and I was I was actually there because I love film and I love history, but I was also writing an article for the Gazette, so I followed her around William S. Hart's house, and we talked and we talked until she finally had to file a restraining order against me, <laughs> and, and then, I, then I read her book, uh, The First King of Hollywood, about Douglas Fairbanks, which is fantastic, so I asked her to marry me. She said no, so I asked her to be on my show instead, and she said yes. Yes. That's so, a compromise. <laughs> here she is. Uh, Dr. Tracy Gossel, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. And I didn't mind you following me around. It, it, it made me look good in my husband's <laughs> eyes, you know, to have this uh, handsome young man <laughs> tailing me. I see. Okay. Well, then it was well worth it. Aside, <laughs> uh, aside from, from being a medical doctor for years, uh, which, mm -hmm. which we can get to, you're also the founder of the Los Angeles-based Film Preservation Society. That's you, correct. You've published numerous articles on silent film history, including your book. You've lectured widely on Douglas Fairbanks, and you're a major collector of silent film ephemera, which is one of my favorite words. Yes. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit uh, about the, the stuff you've collected? What, uh, you know, give us an example of, of some of your favorite pieces of, of ephemera. Well, I, let me just give you a little background. I was about 11 years old when Lillian Gish became my gateway drug to silent movies. Okay, I well, read, that was going to be my first question. How did, how did you first it, begin to fall in love yeah, with the silent I, I read the movies, Mr. Griffith and Me. Okay. And, of course, in 1968, you couldn't see these movies. You could only read about them. Uh, but I read and read and got more books. And, you know, somehow when you're about 
um, in that early teen age, you, that's when you're impressionable. That's when that imprint goes on on you, whether you're going to be a coin collector or a seal, serial killer or whatever it is that's going to define your life. It kind of happens around that age. And for me, it became silent movies. So and you I, hadn't even seen one at, at, no, at that point? No, it, it, wow. it wasn't until I was in high school that I saw an ad in the back of a Saturday Evening Post where you could send away to the great ur urban headquarters of Davenport, Iowa, <laughs> to Black Hawk Films and uh, get 8 millimeter movies, and yeah. you know, Chaplin and Keaton and the uh, D.W. Griffith films and Fairbanks. And so I would iron clothes for a dollar an hour, and at that time, a reel of film cost between 12 and $15, and a reel is about 11 minutes of film. And so I slowly started uh, collecting the films, and then over time, they started to appear on television. But a lot of silent films are lost to us forever because they were filmed on nitrate stock, and there's a, a term that archivists use, which is nitrate won't wait. It starts to rot and dissolve and turn into this rusty powder if uh, we don't get it transferred to safety stock and so um well there's there's also there have also been fires right i mean the, oh, for instance yes. the terrible fires the famous, all of the fox silent exactly. movies in the late 30s because yeah. the famous famous you know tom mix image of him you know leaping over the over beale's cut right that happened right mm -hmm. here in our backyard um that particular film has been lost to my understanding Gone. yep the vast majority of silent films are lost and what remains are still crumbling unless we work to save them today. When I haven't answered your question, what's my favorite collectible? Um, <laughs> okay. I started to collect um, silent movie posters, and I found that I just didn't have deep enough pockets, um, even as an adult, to invest in the Chaplin and the Keatons. But I could afford Doug Fairbanks because he was forgotten. And uh, so I started collecting Doug, and from there, I moved on to collecting um, physical items like his boots from Robin Hood. And this wow. one day came up when an auction house had a little cardboard box that had been in Mary Pickford's estate that was marked personal and private, Miss Pickford. And it was the love letters that Fairbanks had written her back oh in goodness. 1917, 1918. And um, the estimate was low because, again, Doug was largely forgotten. But I ended up in a bidding war against all of these dealers who wanted to split up the letters and sell them. And I wanted them saved for... Um, an archive, the Herrick Library, is where Fairbanks' papers are. So I was bidding, 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 and, you know, you're turning to your kid going, you don't need to go to college, do you? No. <laughs> you know, kept, kept bidding. How about community college? Well, how, how is about you just go to work? Um, anyway, I, a I ended up... A long way from a dollar an hour ironing. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I was, like, I was, I was I, actually, I just had spine surgery, so I will admit I was heavily medicated <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm uh, bidding over the telephone, and I won them. And having won them, I then had these precious, very private things in my hands. And I said to myself, "Golly, what you know? What do you do with these?" And I realized that they would form the basis of a. Um, a biography that would have more primary source material than most Fairbanks biographies had. Mostly people just sort of published these wonderful myths and rumors and stories that were told and passed down that are really colorful but not necessarily true. And so I devoted the next eight years of my life on top of my day job um, to writing a biography of Doug. And that's how I ended up um, being at uh, New Hollywood's first ever silent film festival on their uh, speaker list and got to meet you. Yes, which which again was such a delight, and and just the the sheer magnitude of of knowledge and research that you've done, um, it paints it paints such a, a, a clear picture 
of who this man was and and all that he did, which is which is incredible and and also just intimate. You know what I mean? Like, the, it, like yeah. I guess obviously because of these letters that you were able to get. Well, uh, he was something more than just an Errol Flynn. I mean, this man was a producer. This man was uh, he he um, was a writer. He was a, a very astute businessman. He co-founded the United Artists. He co-founded the Academy of Motion Picture yeah. Arts and Sciences. He founded the very first um, university program to study film, which is the one at USC. That's why they have a statue of him down there. Um, actors don't particularly interest me, but when they're writers or directors or creative forces like William S. Hart, uh, when they're not merely pretty faces in front of a camera, but have a skill set like Fairbanks' stunts and have a, a sense of the ability to really build something that exists to this day. I mean, modern mm -hmm. Hollywood is the way it is in part because of the financial deals that Mary Pickford structured in 1916, because of the distribution arrangement Douglas Fairbanks designed in 1919, we're still living with those today because of those pioneers. And they're really, really intriguing people, apart from being charming and talented and charismatic and, and fun and, to watch yeah, on the screen. Exactly, captivating. I mean, he, you know, yeah. talk, about, talk about a mover. I mean, that guy... You know, that guy could move. <laughs> he could move. So, so why why do you think that that most people today don't know this about Douglas? Don't even know who he is necessarily, like you said. Well, what happened was he um, thought he was being very wise in that he donated to the Museum of Modern Art all of his camera negatives, and uh, it was their burden to be custodians of this material. But they were a museum, an art museum, and not an archive. So their view was, well, you know, we'll pick one or two representative samples and make sure those films are saved, and the rest they just threw in the vault. Throwing something in a vault is a surefire way to have it crumble and turn to dust. And every one of the Fairbanks films that are lost were not lost uh, originally. He had them preserved with the camera negatives and had donated them. And same as uh, Mary Pickford with the Library of Congress when she donated her materials in the 40s, there was insufficient funding, there was insufficient interest. People thought silent movies were, you know, funny, jerky um, uh, artifacts of the past. And, um, you know, things like fractured flickers didn't help. They'd run them too fast, and it was just dreadful. And so people didn't see him, although in one sense, we constantly see him. When we see um, one of the actors, it wasn't Johnny Depp, one of the other ones on Pirates of the Caribbean, slide down a sail by sticking a, a knife in the sail and sure. sliding down, sure. that's stolen directly from <laughs> Doug Fairbanks' stunt in The Black Pirate. When we see Gone with the Wind or The Wizard of Oz, those movies were directed by Victor Fleming. Doug gave him his start as a director. He'd been a cameraman. When we enjoy a Technicolor movie, we don't know, but Doug Fairbanks saved the Technicolor Corporation from going bankrupt when, in 1925, he decided to film The Black Pirate, which was released the following year, in two-strip Technicolor. This man's imprint is everywhere today. Well, but and, nobody... and even, even Beverly Hills. Yep. Weren't he and Mary the first ones to move to Beverly yep. Hills? Nobody <laughs> wanted to live in Beverly Hills. It was Hills. a desert. It was, it was full of coyotes and scrubby stuff. Who it, wanted to live there? Incredible. So me. he he transformed an old hunting lodge, and that house became dubbed Pick Fair for Pickford and Fairbanks. Um, and uh, Beverly Hills became the place for the rich and famous. Charlie Chaplin bought a lot right next door and said, you know, I bought, a, I bought a hill, build me a house. He wanted to be near Doug. And before you knew it, Beverly Hills became 
the desirable address. And Doug and Mary fought to keep Beverly Hills a city separate from Los Angeles with its own police force, fire um, brigade, mm. and water rights. Which is still and the case today. Yep, still the case today because of what they and a few of their uh, friends and allies like Harold Lloyd and Rudolph Valentino did. They went door to door and simply charmed everybody into voting against um, being annexed by the city of Los Angeles. And so the consequences survive 100 years later to choices that were made by this man who was whose father abandoned the family when he was five years old you know he was his his father was a bigamist in fact he was a trigamist he had three families you know moms possibly also um never fully got divorced before she she married his father um he came from a very unpromising start but uh Talk about a guy who, through charm and hard work and bootstraps, uh, made himself one of the most famous people on the planet. Um, he did it. So as as a part of the Film Preservation Society, you founded it, obviously, and are the, uh -huh. and are the president. Um, you're restoring many films at the moment, correct? You, you yes. just finished with a couple of Fairbanks films, Good Bad Man, Half Breed, Double Trouble. Half -breed. Right? Yeah, Double Trouble we're still working on. Okay. And uh, the Half Breed and the Good Bad Man were done in conjunction with the San Francisco Silent Film Festival. We funded it, but we had not yet uh, formed a 501c3. So uh, technically, uh, as as Film Preservation Society, I guess I would have to claim the good bad man. But even of more interest is we have a project going on. And if you go on Facebook and look up a page called The Biograph Project, think biography, biograph, um, we're wor working to restore the 470, roughly, one reel films that D.W. Griffith made between 1908 and 1913. And that was the time when movies moved from being filmed stage plays, static, mm -hmm. you know, showing the whole figure, not only changing right. when the setting changed, to becoming cinematic on things location, where yeah. the camera moved and we put the camera on cars and you cut back and forth between the people who are threatened and the people who are coming to the rescue. All the things that we think of that make movies movies were um, sort of perfected and, and invented in that glorious um, five-year period. And this little troupe of actors and uh, the director went on to take over an industry. Max Sennett, you know, he's playing the butler and, and you know, the, the guy in the crowd in dozens and dozens of these movies. He goes on to found Keystone, uh, Keystone Cops and hires Charlie Chaplin, who was then an unknown. Mary Pickford, of course, became the biggest movie star of her era. Uh, she started. Even unknown people like Lionel Barrymore you know, came in and started at Biograph. So it's this wonderful slice of time. It's sort of like... Well, if you had Mark Twain and you said, boy, I really love reading Mark Twain, but chapter one of Huckleberry Finn is sitting in London and chapter two is in pieces, part of it's in a guy's garage and part of it's in an archive in New York, we, you know, it'd be hard to read Huckleberry Finn from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. We are assembling all the different sources, including um, all of the 1908 films, which are lost, except they exist as rolls of pictures painted, uh, printed on paper strips for copyright purposes at the Library of Congress. Wow. The films have been degraded, but the paper prints survive. So we're scanning those paper prints and digitally assembling the frames. This is incredible. So what? Yeah. So, so what? The end goal, right? Is is you're painting this picture here, that yeah. that that people will get to see this entire right. sort of transformation, this entire birth, it's, I guess, of the industry, yeah, right? The and the transformation of the industry. Of the industry. And, and so you'll be able to say, hey, I'm interested in how silent films address the issue of Native Americans, or 
um, you know, gangsters or union issues or immigrants. And you can go in. We'll have a database where you can view it by theme, or you can say, I'm writing a book about Lionel Barrymore. I want to see only the Lionel Barrymore movies. You'll be able to see those. Incredible. Um, we're having them all scored by the marvelous Donald Sosin. And if you go on the Biograph Project Facebook page, we put a clip of one of um, a scene, just a single scene from um, one of the 1910 movies, so you can hear his music and you can see the caliber of the restoration. It looks like it was filmed yesterday. Amazing. It's, yeah. And he's, it's, he's, it he's composing for 400 some odd short, short yes, films? Yes, but it's, it's a long project. I mean, it's, remember, these are each about 11 minutes long. Um, we, he's allowed to reuse musical themes. Um, sort of like when you see Galma the Wind, whenever you see Rhett Butler, you say, dun, da 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 You know, there, right. there will be sort of Mary Pickford music that may exist across films. There will be um, music for different um, actors. And, of course, uh, if you're doing a movie about cowboys and Indians, you know, you sort of end up using a lot of vintage um, music from the time. Civil War movies. Griffith made a lot of Civil War um, stories. I, I can't wait to see this. Uh, how long... How long is this going to take you? Uh -huh. I mean, um, well, thanks to the pandemic, longer than we had originally planned, we finally, after years of sweet talking and um, you know signing long legal contracts and working with um, the Museum of Modern Art, which has a great number of these um, films stored, and with the Library of Congress, we were getting you know, a number of reels shipped to us. And we're plugging along, and we've got about, you know, 27 films of the 467 um, in the pipeline. And then, dang, the pipeline stopped dead because of the pandemic. Uh, of course. So thus enter William S. Hart. You're up in Newhall. William S. Hart is your guy. <laughs> I fell in love with him that uh, Valentine's Day weekend when I went up there to to meet the wonderful folks. And gosh, I hope you guys have that festival every year. It was really well run. Um, people I, were enthusiastic. I agree. And, and so yeah, they, let, 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 uh, before you get into William S. Hart, okay, uh -huh. don't forget what you're going to say because I, I need to take a quick break. Oh, um, we'll wait for a commercial. Because I want you to tell, tell us also, I mean, I feel like preserving Preserving this history is so important. So I also want you to tell us how we can help. You know, oh, I, don't, absolutely. I don't know where you're getting money from this, but we may as well talk about that too. So we'll take it. St stay with us. We'll okay. be right back. Just a moment. This is Common Ground. I'm Jason Downs talking with Dr. Tracy Gossel, and we'll be right back here on KHTS 98.1 FM. It's allergy season again. You've tried it all. Yet your sinuses continue to be a problem. Try something different, something holistic, something that will really work. Acupuncture. Kathleen Keneally is Santa Clarita's acupuncture and Nate specialist. She's been treating many of your neighbors and their children for allergies, sinuses, headaches, and pain. Find out how acupuncture can improve the quality of your life. Call Kathleen Keneally for a free phone consultation. 252-4100. 252-4100. Acupuncture. It really works. This is Bradley Gross from Santa Clarita Grocery. Santa Clarita Grocery serves fresh groceries to families, individuals, and those experiencing homelessness. At Santa Clarita Grocery, out of every dollar donated, a full 99 cents goes directly to the needs being addressed. As an all-volunteer-led organization, we operate on a 1% overhead, receiving no government funding for our operations in the community, resulting in us being one of the most efficient charities in the Santa Clarita Valley. If you're looking to support the good for our community, please consider part partnering with us by donating to Santa Clarita Grocery. What is donated is specifically kept in the Santa Clarita Valley, helping over 3,000 families, including five other community charities. Please visit our website,
website, santaclaritagrocery.org, or visit us on social media or call us at 425-7575. That's 425-7575. Hi, I'm Eric Goldhurst, Head of Operations for Burger King North America. Throughout this time, we've taken steps to take care of our guests. And since we know many of your jobs have been affected by this crisis, we want to help make sure you're taken care of too. If you are looking for work, we are hiring. And there's a spot on our team for you. We know that we'll get through this together as long as we keep taking care of each other. For more information, call 253-3283. That's 253-3283. I listen to it all day, every day. Hometown, your hometown station. back to Common Ground. I'm Jason Downs. We're talking with Dr. Tracy Gossel, who is the author of The First King of Hollywood, the story of Douglas Fairbanks, and she is also a, a silent film historian. She is also a medical doctor. Um, we were just talking about her, her time at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore um, as the first female, right, in 1986? Uh, in, in, my, in my division, first yeah. First female in, in your department. division, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was 86. Uh, we were still kind of a novelty in medicine at that time. And I can guarantee you uh, one of my fellow residency mates, uh, identically trained to me with an identical amount of experience, uh, came in uh, on my urging and joined our department the next year. But he was a man, so they paid him uh, more than they paid me. Oh. For <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. It was the 80s. Uh, but you've, uh, you obviously, how, how long were you there, though? I mean, you stayed. Oh, my golly. I was there until um, the early to mid-90s. I had an HIV exposure when I was pregnant with my second baby. Mm. And that's when I said, hmm, I think maybe it's time to move into administration. You know, okay. you work in the inner city. But, but we're off topic. It was just during the commercial we were pandemic right, right. gossiping. Well, well, I mean, you know, obviously the coronavirus is, is on all of our minds. And, oh, yes. And, uh, you know, I know that you you have some thoughts and opinions I, I i don't know if you heard dr cohen but he his his plain and simple message was wear masks for the common yes. good for the common my god good. don't make it political <laughs> wash your hands exactly. wear a mask it's just that simple so as far as the biograph project as far yes. as the the film preservation society mm -hmm. where do you get the money to do this incredible uh, historical project, this, this preservation well, I, that you're attempting? I have to confess, I've been funding it all myself, which is really? why one, one reason why it happens slowly, because each year I sort of have to earn enough, and then whatever is uh, left over goes Why to hasn't this been done before? Why isn't the Smithsonian doing it? Why isn't the, the U.S. government doing it? Why, you know what I mean? Why, why, is it, why, why does it why come down film, to you? <laughs> right. Why did the films turn to dust yes. years ago? The, the fact of the matter is, 10 years ago, when I was writing the Fairbanks biography, I said, I need to see the half-breed and the good bad man. They're not out there. And the only way I could see them was to fund the restoration. And that's what I did. Incredible. And so, Incredible. but we do ask for people's help. We're, we'd love it if people would send money, but, but we're not asking in these hard times for people to send money. What we're asking instead is when you shop on Amazon, if instead you go to smile.amazon.com, just think, a smile, it makes you happy, right? Smile.amazon.com, like yeah. and you can pick a charity, and we're one of the charities. We're a 501c3. If you choose Film Preservation Society, Inc., INC Incorporated, then a fraction of a penny of every purchase you make at no cost to you, gets funneled to the charity. Jeff Bezos essentially is, is to, to, for, as a feel-good thing, uh, taking some of Amazon's profits, a tiny little bit, and letting people um, 
assign them to their charities of choice, SPCA Amazing. or yeah. Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and we are one of those charities. Now, granted, when we started it, every quarter we got $16. You know, it wasn't a lot. But if more people and more people and more people uh, just go to smile.amazon.com and choose Film Preservation Society, Inc., it won't cost you a penny and it will help preserve silent films. And my feeling is, if I want this done, if I really believe in it, I have to put up or shut up. So my beloved parents died. That's where the inheritance went. It, it funds this. Well, bless um, you and bless them. I mean, speaking there of... There has to be an eccentric out there somewhere. I'm that eccentric. <laughs> I don't think it's that eccentric. I think it's necessary. I, I, I it think is. It's so important. And when you see these movies, you understand why, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, li it's literally history. history. Yes, it's literally yeah. history, not just film history. History. So, so talking about William S. Hart, we, we yes. started just uh, just before the break, right? Um, so, y I mean, you're, you're you're restoring and distributing several well, of his movies, right? Well, because um, we can't get reels of film from the archives, it happened that the Library of Congress had assembled and scanned a number of William S. Hart films, two real shorts plus features, and then they considered that restoration finished, right? They found all the different disparate sources, they patched them together, they had it digitally scanned, and they were done. But they're, they're really, that's not a full restoration. You need to stabilize the film so it doesn't jump, you know, sprockets tear over the years. You need to clean up all the scratches. You need to bring it back to the way it looked the year it was filmed. You don't want to make it sharper than it was, but you want to make it as good as it was. Mm -hmm. And believe me, 35 millimeter back in 1910, you can see every every pore on their face in a close up. They're, it really, really, really is, was that. Huh. Yeah, it was just as good as it is today. Love that. Matter of fact, they didn't put filters on to make the leading lady look uh, younger. You know, <laughs> it was just sharp and clear and good. So we are um, doing the digital restoration on all of these William S. Hart films, and we're going to release them on Blu-ray. The Amazing. standard distribution folks like Kino and um, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the name of Jeff Messino's shop, but these wonderful shops can't do it because they're not—they're going to lose money on it, and and I understand that it's 